Hello, it's Mr. Turek again. Um, this is one of my favorite assignments for students. Uh, essentially, you're going to learn how to match your colors in your reference uh, for a painting. This is an invaluable skill, uh, especially because it's kind of the key to realism, and it can help you do a lot of other things too, uh, since most of your job when you're painting is kind of mixing and, and preparing colors instead of just sort of using colors like you would in pastels or colored pencils or with other media that are colored, you know. You, you spend a lot of time mixing colors and this is sort of like a, a, a guided, more focused way of doing that. Uh, you have three choices for this assignment. The first choice is the color grid, second is uh, the close crop painting, and then the third is the comic book collage painting. Um, the main objective here is to match the color of your reference 100% uh, with 100% accuracy. So, you know, regardless of whether you pick either project, I mean, I don't necessarily, I don't really care about the form at all, again. What I care is, is do you have the, the core skill I'm trying to get you to learn, which is do you match the colors 100% accurately? All right. So the process of matching a color is pretty simple. What you should do first is on your reference photograph that you're painting, uh, you should isolate the color you're trying to match. Now you can use a viewfinder, uh, you can just simply look at the color or you know point to it with your finger or just sort of like cut it out any way you want. Um, I'm going to show you a couple different methods in the demonstration at the end. But the core concept is you isolate that color and you decide to match it. So you make an educated guess. Um, if you think back to your uh, color theory poster, or your painting theory poster, you're going to remember that kind of this, this color probably looks like kind of a dirty purple. You could probably add gray to it, or black and white, but uh, my guess would be you'd add a little bit of yellow to it, and then, you know, maybe a little bit of white. But uh, if you look at the bottom here, you know, that mixture that we came up with, not quite the color we want and, and if you were to take this color and paint it onto this color you would notice it's a, it's a bit too warm it's a bit too uh, you know kinda like reddish or, or purpley and it needs to be a little bit deader a little bit more blue um, now we could add blue to this mixture or you know when you start off your purple you may have to mix your own purple purple is a secondary color so it can be mixed using two other colors and you know there's lots of options here to match this color you could use different blues, use different reds, use an entirely different yellow, use no yellow, use grays. There's there's a billion different options, a billion different like ways to get to the answer. But the answer is what matters, and and how you get there doesn't matter to me so long as you have the exact same color here as you do here. Um, this is the process you need to go through. Now in the demonstration, I'll show you this process kind of more in depth, but uh, it. it can seem kind of frustrating and it, it can seem like it's going to take a while but once you get the hang of it you really do start to do it automatically and you start to do it with um, without checking you just sort of know oh that's you know orange green and, and a little bit of white and a little bit of brown you know and that'll make this color um, so it's it's valuable in that sense when you get it really practiced and honed it, it can become an, a valuable asset your first assignment choice, uh, your first choice is the color grid. Um, you're going to take your painting and you're going to break it up using your own handmade grid. So you can't just use a one inch grid. A one inch grid has about 88 squares to it. I need you to do more squares than that. So maybe do a half inch grid, uh, which is a hell of a lot more squares. Um, and your, your, your reference should be in color. Uh, when you break it up with your grid, you'll, you'll draw that grid on another surface obviously it can be any surface and then you'll try to match the dominant color in each grid square on your reference to uh, the painting and that's all you do for this one pretty straightforward uh, we're going based off of kind of a uh, Chuck Close's work um, Chuck Close is uh, kind of the only artist I have included in here there's there's other artists obviously that use this method but I'm just gonna talk about this one example here this is a watercolor so again you have complete choice as to which medium you use if you want to use watercolor you can and uh, this one obviously is, is just absolutely massive this is like a 50 inch by 40 inch painting and there are quite a few grid squares in here 
uh, thousands. I, I haven't actually counted. Um, and his method actually is in, e extremely labor intensive. I don't know if you can see it in here, but in this detail on the right hand side, you see the little glistening colors in the edges between the grid squares? That's because he literally layers colors to match his colors. Like he won't make blue just with like straight blue. He'll take blue and then he'll layer yellow and then he'll layer red over that to make blue kind of like a printer. Um, and that's how he matches his colors. I do not expect you to do that, <laughs> but you can You can try it if you want. Uh, I have tons of um, books on Mr. Close that you can kind of look through and check out. But this is kind of what we're taking as the starting point for this assignment. Here's some student examples, excellent examples of what uh, you're supposed to do for your color grid. Break it up and then try to match the dominant color in each grid square. Uh, you'll notice that it will kind of not look like your subject, and that's okay. It's, it's gridded, it's pixelated, kind of, so it'll look a little weird. And sometimes dominant colors will come to the fore, like you can notice on this right-hand side picture here, it's a really greenish cast to it, and that's okay too. Um, you're not going to be able to match the colors. Uh, or make the colors look like the subject in this assignment. You're going to probably make it look close to what the subject would look like in this assignment. And that's that's fine. You can, you can get as close as you can with these, but I should see natural flesh tones. I should see uh, the colors that are dominant in the source material if you're to do this right. So really, really look at your source and match each color on your source like I do in the demonstration uh, to before you put it on your canvas. Uh, your next option is the close crop painting. Uh, essentially this is photorealism. Um, the process is pretty simple. You can pick any photographic reference you want, but instead of painting the entire photographic reference one for one, like the photorealists from you know the 60s, 70s, whatever, you're, you're just going to crop into like a small section of that painting and you're going to paint that as best you can. Um, I'll kind of show you some examples of what I'm expecting here. Here's, here's kind of the process you can go through for cropping. Uh, just you know kind of some options here. You don't necessarily have to like keep the orientation of the photo. You don't even need to have the photo look like the photo. Like sometimes when you crop in on things, they sort of lose their sense of existence and you don't really know if what you're seeing is a part of this or a part of that, which is which is fine. You can do that. The kind of the the start of this sort of uh, like particular style of cropping way, way in on a subject kind of started with Georgia O'Keeffe. It started before her with the Impressionists and the advent of photography, but uh, Georgia O'Keeffe took it to a whole new level when she just sort of like s quieted everything down, made everything sort of hushed and, and intimate and, and very, very, very close and very, very simple. Uh, she kind of takes liberties with her forms and, and some big liberties with her color that I don't necessarily want you to take, but for the most part she is being pretty representational. Like these look like the flowers look like the actual flowers that she's painting. But um, even though they look like the flowers she's painting, sometimes she'll she'll break that mold. Like the painting on the right here really, really kind of breaks the mold of what that flower could potentially look like. And she sort of starts playing around with forms. Uh, just sort of look to her for like inspiration when it comes to composition. And then realize you, you have to stick strictly to the colors you see in your reference. Uh, you don't get to be quite as free uh, with the colors as she is being. Another example of O'Keefe being pretty free. Uh, I'm not probably going to talk over the rest of these slides, but just take a look at them. Uh, some of the ones at the end here are very photorealistic and extremely, extremely detailed. But chief among that, among the concerns those artists have, are concerns for color. The reason those look so photoreal is because those artist works are extremely well documented. Like if you take a look here, this looks exactly like blades of grass. It's not necessarily, you know, 100% accurate, but it, it has the perfect right colors. Like you can tell that's a dandelion stock based on that kind of reddish brown 
and the greens are you know so evocative of true grass so you know you can project your image onto your canvas you can trace it onto your canvas you can draw it with the grid you know how to draw and transfer images to your canvas what I'm mostly concerned with here is do you match the colors 100% so take a look at a couple of these next slides and just sort of soak in uh, the concerns of those artists All right, so your last option here is my favorite option by far. This is a this is a project I actually borrowed from a former high school art teacher of mine, and I did this project when I was in high school. Um, it taught me a lot about color matching, and it was a really fun project. I really enjoyed it, so that's kind of why I'm teaching it now. I kind of call it the comic book collage painting because uh, that's essentially what it is. You can call it comic book painting for short. Um, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to create a collage. It doesn't have to necessarily be of comic books, but you know, comic books have bright, beautiful colors, really cool shapes, and the colors are flat. So it's, it's a lot easier to match a flat color for a flat color as opposed to matching, you know, like a, like a, a smooth gradient to a smooth gradient. You know, if you want to make your collage of like photorealistic things or photographs, you, you're more than welcome to. But it becomes a little bit more challenging when you do that. And essentially, that collage is the reference point for the, your painting. So same same process though. You you have to transfer your image to your canvas, and then you need to match your colors 100% color for color. The progenitor of this particular style could be Rosenquist. Um, he's kind of what I thought of when I thought of this particular project. Uh, Rosenquist was a uh, pop artist in the 60s. And he was kind of famous for taking, you know, pop culture and Americana imagery and just sort of collaging it together and just painting it as is, as it was. Um, the 60s were kind of the start of all this full color advertising and, and commercial and uh, commoditization of the American dream. So, you know, the, the artists of that time really reacted to that strongly, and, and Rosenquist was just enamored, kind of, with um, just all the bright, beautiful colors and all the, you know, fanfare behind this consumerist culture. And he actually, before he became a fine art painter, he was a sign painter. You know, back in the day, billboards and signs and stuff, they weren't, you know, printed out and just kind of pasted up there. They had to actually hire craftsmen and tradesmen to physically paint those. So that's kind of where he got a start. Uh, this is a massive um, painting of Rosenquist's. It actually spreads across two slides because I just want you to kind of soak in his color and his, his wonderful sense of uh, composition. Here's the rest of that uh, mural there. Again, bright, you know, tin foil colors like balloons, confetti, I'm not sure what it is. But uh, with Rosenquist, he, he, sometimes you can tell what the image is, sometimes you can't. It, he definitely takes a very loose approach to collage, or he's very simple with his collages. Like there's only a handful of images, you know, two or three images. And most of these paintings, by the way, are, are absolutely massive, uh, very large paintings, but you know, you can still achieve kind of the same effects at a small scale. Uh, David Sale, a couple notes on him. David Sale was a uh, painter in I think the 80s and 90s. Uh, he's still alive today. He he's kind of the start of uh, uh, postmodernism and sort of the breakdown of or deconstructionalist I should say, deconstructivist uh, thought in painting. So like he he was all about like none of these images mean anything. Uh, the associations between these images don't mean anything, and and my painting means nothing. That that's kind of what he started. Like he didn't, he doesn't really, you know, like put them together for any s real sense. Like they're all kind of subconscious, like arbitrary decisions. Now he gets to do that, obviously, and and you get to do that as an artist. But you know, 
most of the time in an academic setting we want you to have like reasons for why you paint what you paint and and it's not that Sally didn't he just sort of is is reacting to and sort of like talking about kind of this this era where we're in right now where there's so much imagery and so much media you can't really sort through it all so you know his his stuff is really evocative of just sort of that postmodern like sort of disillusionment with uh, reality and, and just the oversaturation of consumerist culture and media. Oh boy, Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons bears mentioning here just because he's Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons is one of the highest paid, uh, top grossing contemporary artists working in the field today. Uh, he's not actually an artist. He's what he was a lawyer or like a trade stock trader on uh, Wall Street, and he just decided, I want to make art. So he started making art, and you know, he, it's not that he can't draw, but he, he he certainly didn't paint these paintings. Actually, he didn't paint any of these paintings. He uh, he hired studio hands to paint these paintings, and basically what he did was he picked the composition, or arranged the composition for them, and had them paint them for him. So these are oil paintings done to like an, an extremely exacting degree of, of hyper realism and they're just gorgeous full of color and just humor and just wit and just complete disregard for academia and like just the sense of like reality um, so Coons is worth looking into just because he's so absurd and some of his stuff is really really appealing and cool just because it's just like just a middle finger to the establishment in so many ways. Um, but the reason I have him here is because, you know, just the craftsmanship involved in this is, is just alarming. Uh, you know, his studio hands just did a phenomenal job on some of these. Aaron Noble. Aaron Noble is kind of the, the reason this project exists, I think. Uh, he, he takes he is actually famous for taking uh, comic books, and then he, he doesn't really like depict the people or any recognizable parts of the comic books. He just sort of takes those background parts or the uniform or the hair, and he just collages them together, and he paints them. Sometimes he'll paint them like mural size, like really, really large on a wall. Sometimes he'll just keep the collage and call that an artwork or, you know, make it a drawing. But he's he pretty much paints all of these, and they're all from actual physical comic books before they're a painting so look to him for just sort of inspiration as to what parts of the comic book you can use you don't necessarily have to use like Superman a picture of Superman like Superman's cape is just as interesting as Superman is the way comic book artists kind of you know draw it and again this is probably the easier option in terms of this uh, approach here uh, the previous examples all use photorealistic collages here it's just flat colors and a lot of black outlines um, I highly recommend if you're choosing to use a comic book as the center of your collage that you um, paint paint the colors first and then uh, you uh, paint the black over the colors uh, that's I think what he would probably do Mr. Noble but uh, that's definitely what I would do if I were doing this and I see a lot of students kind of ignoring that advice but you can you can layer your colors so long as they're matched you know the black is probably the easiest part and it should probably be last a lot of these areas are large areas of single colors like if you notice uh, over here on the far right this hand here is like lime greens light greens and then there's a lot of black in it uh, you know you can just paint the whole area solid green do all your your color shifts and then paint black last it will save you a lot of time Joram Rokes kind of takes a, a, a much looser approach to this whole like collage painting thing he's very painterly uh, it kind of takes some liberties with this background um, but you can still tell there's a collage there and he's sort of like combining a bunch of different things together uh, photorealistic things cartoons uh, photographs and then sometimes they'll change the colors I don't quite want you to be uh, this loose with it. You can be kind of loose, um, but just take a look at his his paintings, and then there's a bunch of other slides of other artists and their artworks um, after Mr. Rorick's here. So just take a look at those. There are some really cool artists um, coming up here. Uh, and at the end, I'll talk about some of the student examples.
All right, here's some excellent student examples um, from the previous year. Both of these, if you saw the reference, that's pretty much what the reference looked like. Um, I think the artist on the left, Christy, she she used a lot of stuff from like Tumblr. That's completely fine. The artist on the right, uh, Hunter, she um, she used just comic books, and uh, both of them were pretty selective. Like they only picked what they wanted to paint. Like uh, Hunter here, you can tell these big black areas are areas she kind of cut out and didn't want to paint. That's fine, uh, but you know she matched an awful lot of colors. And, you know, you'll notice in both of them, sometimes the form, like the way the face looks or the proportions of certain things, aren't, it isn't exactly, you know, 100% accurate. And that's, that's completely fine. Uh, the colors here are 100% accurate, and that's kind of what I care about. Um, the colors here, you know, like the, the, the bumblebee in Christie's painting, that, that is extremely accurate. Well done. The flesh tones in Hunter's are dead on, that kind of comic booky sort of peach color. Um, and it took them a while to get those colors, so that's exactly what I'm concerned with, and uh, that's exactly what I want to see out of your work. Take a look at some of these other student examples. Uh, some of them, there's only a handful of the other two projects. Uh, most people do the comic book collage, but uh, take a look at some of those, and then um, stick around for the demonstration. Okay, on to one of my favorite concepts, uh, color matching. Uh, the color matching assignments are great assignments. I really like them. I probably couldn't choose if I had to. Uh, but for this example, I am going to do the close cropped painting. Uh, so I've taken a magazine advertisement and I, I kind of cut out a small little interesting part of it. You can kind of tell what it is. It's a nose and a, some lips of some model or something. Um, and I kind of broke it up into a loose grid to kind of draw on my paper here. I don't care how you transfer your image. You can use the opaque projector. You can use a grid. You can, uh, if it's see-through, you can trace it, whatever. Um, but as soon as you got it kind of transferred, um, one thing you need to know about your reference is you should protect it with some kind of uh, protective coating. So you can use acetate. Acetate's in number 34, which is the bottom cabinet, uh, bottom drawer of the file cabinet near my desk. Or you can use a, a clear masking tape, and, then, and that's what I'm actually going to use for this. You just need a little bit to kind of cover the image. The reason you want to protect your image is simple. Uh, you need something that you can paint on and then scratch the paint off of uh, so that you can continue to match a color or try to match a color. Okay? So let's just cover this with tape. All right, fold that over. I can even cut off the extra here. And this will just kind of pr protect my image from the paint while I paint on it. It doesn't matter that it changes the color a little bit, okay? It's okay. But now when I paint on this, if I don't match my color, I can just wipe it off or I can scratch it off when it dries and uh, try to match that color again, okay? You want to do this for your reference or you want to make multiple copies of your reference so that you uh, are able to match the exact colors and so that you're able to uh, see your reference. Um, so let's get uh, color matching here. I've got a full palette, uh, at least one of every color. You never know what you're going to need. Um, I don't have every single color I have or own, uh, but I have enough of each of the basic colors to kind of get myself started here. And, uh, you know, when you color match, it, it's best to start out with more than you probably think you need because you never know when that weird color might come in handy. Um, I'm just going to use a flat. I'm not going to spend too much time kind of getting this absolutely perfect, but I will walk you through how to match some basic colors, or at least the process I want you to go through when matching colors. So, uh, when you kind of get started, make an educated guess, okay? So my educated guess here, based on years of knowledge, obviously, is that this is orange. Uh, it's a flesh tone, so orange is probably a good place to start. Take a little bit of orange here, take a little bit of some white, Okay, and I've already got some green in the middle here, so that's kind of contaminating my orange. I'll bring it over here. All right, and uh, you do actually want to knock this orange down a little bit. Maybe use some burnt sienna. Okay, maybe a little bit of uh, vermilion here. Okay, to make it more fleshy, more red, and just make a guess. Uh, you know, I'm not really being too scientific here. I'm just sort of like saying, I think it's this, and making a mixture. Uh, you don't have to make the guess right 
when you make your first guess. It's a guess. So if it becomes kind of uh, annoying that you're not guessing right, that's okay. I kind of feel like I know what color it is because I've done this a lot. You may not have that feeling just yet. So you're going to want to make a couple more mistakes before you start to get it right. It's okay if you make mistakes. Making mistakes is a good thing. So let's try it. All right, not bad. Uh, a little bit too warm. I don't know if you can see it here. Let's zoom in. Let's try that. Okay, a little bit too warm, a little bit too creamy. Not quite pale enough. This area here is especially white. So we're gonna really lighten this up, okay? And I'm just gonna go right next to the mixture I already made. If you can't see it, bring it in here. And I've got my kind of flesh tone. I'm kind of digging that up and adding a whole lot more white to it. Let's try it again. Okay? A little bit too white. Now, this is kind of the trouble with color matching, is you're going to go a lot of back and forth here. That's okay. Again, I'm making a mistake right now. I'm not quite matching it perfectly. I'm fine with that. It's going to be a little frustrating. It's going to be a little bit of trial and error here. You're going to have to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you get it. And when you do, it'll be this awesome, awesome moment where it's like, oh, hey, that's the color I was looking for all along. Okay? Okay? Getting closer in value, it's still a little bit too pure. Um, if things are too pure, too uh, saturated, you want to use their opposite. So I, I want to use actually a little bit of blue, okay, to kind of knock it down or a little bit of purple. Purple goes great with orange and does a lot to kind of knock it down, knock it back. Kind of make it a bit dirtier, a bit muddier. You wouldn't think it would, but it does. Okay, starting to disappear in there. Not quite seeing it. And I can wipe off again my reference here since this paint is still really super wet. I can scratch it off there. Okay, it's all clean now. And I can try to match it again. Now, that's not 100% perfect accurate, but it's getting really, really close. Super, super close there. You're probably going to get within just a, a smidgen of that color. I'm not going to expect you to have 100% almost perfect accuracy here, but what I want you to do is get to that as close as you can. Or at least until you hit a barrier where you're just like, I give up. Um, I, I have, happen to have a propensity for not giving up when it comes to these sort of things. So I like to sit here and kind of keep fiddling with it until I get it. And that's okay. You, on the other hand, may have a lower tolerance for that. Get as close as you can. It's okay if you don't quite get it 100%. If you do get it 100%, what you're going to start to achieve is realism. Realism is very easy. It's color matching. If you can match your color, you've got it. Just put that color in the right place, you're good to go. Okay? So we've got a couple of flesh tones in there, getting kind of close, not quite. Let's uh, put it on our canvas here. So zoom out. Okay? And when I apply that, I'm going to be very selective. It's really only in this area above the lips here. Okay? We're going to fade that out. I can kind of water it down and sort of gently fade it out here. Notice my grid, my pencil line is showing through. I probably wanted to erase that before I put it on there. Okay, and I can kind of block that basic value in. As I come up to the nose around here, I don't want to keep that too soft or uh, too hard, sorry. I want to soften that edge and just sort of fade it out because we're going to have to switch to a different color when we hit the nose. Okay. The nose is obviously a different color, so let's try to match that. My guess would be it's still within the orange range. Okay, so I'm going to start with some orange and some red there. Maybe add some pure yellow to make it more orange. Okay, and then to get that kind of muddy brownish color, again, blue. Let's try blue. Okay, I could use burnt sienna if I wanted to. 
but often burnt sienna just goes a little bit too dark. So there we go, we've tried it. it gets a little bit too dark there. We gotta add some more white. I've got some white right here. Okay. And the reason I'm always starting with uh, just pure color, again, is so that I don't lose the saturation. You can always go too dark. You can't go too light, really. If you go too dark, that really messes up your mixture. Like if I add too much brown to this, it's going to take an awful lot of white and an awful lot of orange to get back to my full saturation here. And I don't want to have to do that every time. So keep it, keep it on the light side. Keep your colors pure and then go dark. That'll make it easier for you. Okay, so I got my mixtures here and let's cross combine. Let's check. Okay, a little bit too light. Getting there. Somewhere in between too dark and too light, probably. Let's go back to that blue and orange mixture. All right, here's your blue and orange. Let's add a little bit of that to there. Try that. Okay, starting to disappear now. Can't quite see it. I'm gonna zoom in just so you can really get a sense for it. Okay, so the color I think I've matched is on the bottom here. Okay, sort of starting to disappear in certain areas. Let's wipe it off and see if it's really the true color. Okay, and we add a little bit of purple here. All right. So, starting to disappear there. Getting kind of close. When I paint with it, I'm going to zoom back out here. When I paint with it, now it's just a matter of, because I think I have the color, now it's just a matter of keeping my edge soft so that it fades out to this other color. And hopefully you can make that other color again, or you can kind of loosely match it and fade between the two. Okay? Um, as you go, you want to do this process every time you make a color, you want to match it to your reference. It can be a little frustrating at times because you're not getting quite close enough. Get as close as you can. I'm trying to get as close as I can and I'm still not close enough. Um, it's it's going to be some trial and error there. You're not quite going to get it on your first couple tries. By the end of this painting, if I'm super, super tedious and I take a lot of time matching each and every individual different color that I see, I'm going to get way better at it. To be honest with you, I, I kind of invent most of my colors, so I haven't had to do this in a while, which is why I'm kind of rusty. Um, but if I were to continue, I mean, I'd start to pick up old habits, get remember some color matching things I, I've learned before, maybe remember some old combinations on the palette that I've used before, and I'll start to get more accurate. Uh, that's really what you're doing. You're practicing your accuracy with this. No matter which assignment you choose, you have to match it on your reference before you put it on your palette, and you should get as 100% close to the original as you can. Um, call me over if you're having trouble making a guess as to what colors you need. Uh, chances are I'll probably know a couple of colors that you can try to get pretty darn close. And you are kind of limited by the colors we have available. Like the fact that I have my palette set up the way it is, is limiting what I'm able to achieve on my canvas here. If I don't have the right colors to start, there's no way, no matter how many mixtures I do, that I can match these colors. I would probably need a different pigment to start out with. So that's okay that I'm getting kind of, sort of close. I know I don't have the right blue. I know I don't have the right red, and that's okay. Um, please, please, please ask me for help if you get stuck with this. This is not meant to be frustrating. This is meant to give you a skill, a discernible skill, to be able to match the exact color that you see on your reference, okay? And that's what you're working towards.